Well, David uh, McAllister Wilson is always a good friend to have uh, as a person to introduce you. And, and it reminds me, he's referenced to Lyndon Johnson. When Lyndon Johnson got abusively introduced by people, he would uh, often say, well, I wish my mother and my father could have heard that fine introduction because my father would have enjoyed it and my mother, she would have believed it. <laughs> we are uh, indeed gathered here today exactly one year before our next national election uh, to talk about the things that we don't discuss in polite company, as David said, politics and religion. Now, I actually got this lesson from my grandmother once. <clears throat> I was uh, visiting my grandparents uh, at their rural home in South Carolina, in upstate South Carolina, and I was celebrating my 18th birthday in October of 1972. I was a Princeton freshman, and I was quite full of myself. Uh, and my grandparents were southern textile workers uh, who had a picture of Franklin Roosevelt on their mantle in the sacred spot that they had there. So I uh, proudly announced to them that I was, as a result of the 26th Amendment to the Constitution, which had just been ratified, I was going to cast my first ballot for president. I said, however, that I, th I thought things didn't look too good for our candidate. Well, said my grandfather, Lloyd McCurry, I'm voting for Nixon. We need to keep a good Christian man in the White House, <laughs> implying, of course, that George McGovern was not. And I'm not sure exactly what I said next, but I'm sure it wasn't rather polite. So my uh, grandmother, at that point, gently reminded us that politics and religion were best left off the table at dinner. And then later, as we were doing dishes, she whispered to me that there had been a lot of talk at church about how McGovern was just not the right candidate because, you know, he doesn't really relate to our kind. So in retrospect, there are several things clear from that encounter. First, that the Nixon Southern strategy of fueling anxiety about race was clearly working. Second, that a shift in America's political tectonics was taking place and that the solid South was moving out of the Democratic column where it had been since Franklin Roosevelt and into the Republican column. And third, that even casual conversations on a Sunday morning at church was and is now a place where citizens think about the values and the trajectory of where our national discourse is going. So the role of the church, the role the people of faith play in our national discourse is not to be ignored. It needs to be better understood. That's my topic today, what we call public theology. Now, if you are a regular at this series, you know that we've been reflecting on the text that's in Jeremiah 29, and that text and the context of that text, if you were here last month, was wonderfully explicated by my faculty colleague, Sandra Wheeler, and I'm kind of incorporating a lot of what she said last month and what I'm going to say today. The prophet advises the people of Israel in exile in Babylon to seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. What then follows, of course, is a full-blown Jeremiah against all the other false prophets. <laughs> but this curious admonition to pray for the oppressor, to accept the fact of exile, to seek the welfare of the city where people must sing songs in a strange land. That certainly challenges our perspective this morning. For many here in Washington who are here to do the official business of this city, sojourn seems to be exile. Politicians running for office loudly proclaim that they are not part of the Washington establishment. They vow to return to the promised land in America's heartland as fast as they can. Our Congress sits only from Tuesdays to Thursdays so that members can get out of the town as fast as possible. Now, most of professional Washington comes from some place other than Washington, except for the native Washingtonians. Many of them are African American who are here mostly to provide goods and services to the people who come and go as administrations change and shift. But who are the Babylonians? 
in the folklore of our current politics, they are the entrenched special interests that make Washington more of a permanent residence. The lobbyists who advance the particular agenda of wealthy corporations and large organizations, for profit and not for profit, with pending matters of business before our legislature and our regulatory agencies. The national media, which creates a narrative about Washington that's often designed to arouse emotion and hold the audience's attention as much as it is to inform and to educate. And a permanent cadre of campaign advisors, pollsters, media consultants, influence brokers, who live to fight the next fight, to win the next election, to curry some favor with those who hold power for however temporarily. Now that's not a very attractive portrait of a city that, in the words of Ronald Reagan, was supposed to shine on the hill, to be reflections of God's love of a new Jerusalem, to a people unshackled by the bondage of authoritarianism, liberated to live free in a land of democratic freedom. There's widespread consensus now in our nation that our politics is broken and that we need to fix it. Indeed, last week, if you looked in the Washington Post, there was a full page ad signed by more than 100 former congressmen, governors, senators, that basically said under a picture of the US Capitol with scaffolding around it, literally the metaphor of a nation that needs to be fixed, a headline that said, we can fix this. And in a way, that was sort of their letter to the exiles in Washington who seek the welfare of the city. So let's start by examining some of the sources of our discontent. I've got some slides that I want to share with you. Uh, these come from two friends of mine, Doug Sosnick, a guy who worked with me in the Clinton White House, and a guy named Bruce Melman, who's a Republican lobbyist. <clears throat> but first, it shows how deeply <clears throat> the public trust in government has eroded since the 1960s. You'll see a brief uptick there after 9-11, but see the st steady decline in public trust for the government. Less than a quarter of Americans report that they trust the government in Washington to do the right thing most of the time. The next is really the classic measure of what pollsters use to measure the mood of the country. Is the country moving in the right direction or is it on the wrong track? Since the beginning of the 21st century, the majority of Americans say we are on the wrong track. This is the longest sustained period of time <clears throat> that a majority of Americans say we're headed in the wrong direction. I don't have a slide for the next point, but Americans also say that for, for the first time they don't believe that the next generation will have a better quality of life than the current generation. So you think about that for a second. That's the very essence of what we call the American dream. If you work hard, you play by the rules, your kids will be better off, the next generation will prosper better than ours. <clears throat> now, the next is President Obama's approval rating. You'll see he has hovered around 50% approved, 50% disapproved for most of the time that he has been president. So we are not focusing the locus of our discontent on the president that serves us. Uh, Congress does not care well very much either, um, and neither does the Republican Party, as you can see from that, this slide. Uh, for Congress, less than 15% approve of the, its performance, and the disapproval of the Republican Party is consistent as you can see, with what you know, generally is the general public sentiment that things are not moving in the right direction. I think a part of this is because, if you look at what the Republicans uh, in their Rost expressions of views believe, they don't want <coughs> just to compromise with the other side. Conservative Republican voters, and they will dominate the primary vote that's coming up in next year's presidential election. They favor candidates who will stick to their positions rather than offering positions of compromise. And unless you think I'm being overly partisan, <laughs> Democrats don't fare much better either. They rate better than Republicans, but the public mostly divides equally in giving them a positive and a negative rating. So without much surprise, the fastest 
growing element of our electorate are those who declare themselves independent and free from the blandishments of the two major parties. This is the highest share of the national electorate that has ever declared itself to be independent, free from the boundaries of our two-party system. Now, lurking beneath this partisan affiliation is the changing demographic composition of the American electorate. Since 1992, the share of the majority white vote has been in steady decline. African American voters have increased in number, so have Asians. So the fastest growing component of the electorate are Hispanic voters, and the time is not far off when they will be the majority of all the electorate, and they nearly are already in California, and they will be soon in other states that are critical to the electoral college. Not only states like Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, which already have sort of a key role in the battleground for the presidency, but also states like Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, and of course the biggest prize, Florida, where non-Cuban Hispanics are now the deciding factor in any statewide election there. Now, this is not the demographic composition of a nation that my grandparents would have recognized, and I kind of suspect it's not one that would have made them very comfortable either. With these important shifts in demographics come changes in how we as a nation think about the institutions which have a major influence on <clears throat> our culture, our life, and our society. Now, <clears throat> this chart ranks a lot of our major institutions according to how the public perceptions have changed about them. You know, have they improved in the public mind or have they declined? And you'll see that the military, the small business, the police, they receive major approval from Americans, although some of these data points don't reflect some of what might have happened after some of the events we've seen in Charleston, controversy over Black Lives Matters and things like that. But look at the church and organized religion down there at the bottom. Historically, more than half of Americans approve the church, but its ranking has dropped faster and more precipitously than any other institution except for Congress. And that's saying something. So if Americans are skeptical about large institutions which have influence over our lives, who do they think has power? Who do they think benefits most from the status quo? Well, there's the picture of our Babylon. Who the American people believe have benefited most from policies since the Great Recession of 2007-2008. Large banks, financial institutions, large corporations, wealthy people. Now this survey did not measure who controls the narrative about our public discourse, but other research, uh, research suggests that Americans are equally skeptical about big media about the people who really present to us the picture of what we do in our national discourse. Now, I hate to be such a downer this morning. Um, it was such a beautiful day, I'll say. But this is not the composite photo of a happy nation. Americans mistrust almost all their leaders, all their leading institutions. They believe our nation's on the wrong track. They dislike those who have power here in Washington. They're firmly anti-establishment. Most of them have experienced no real growth in their income, in their wage income over the last two decades. So their fears and their anxiety about the future are very real and very tangible. And that's, you know, I know a snapshot that does not take into account nuance because there are pockets of optimism and hope but if you step back and look at this picture, you cannot be surprised that the leading candidates for president that we hear mentioned have names like Trump and Carson and Cruz. And that establishment figures like Bush are being challenged by a Rubio. And that yet another Clinton is being challenged by a socialist named Sanders. Now we can <clears throat> talk more about politics later with your questions. But I think my question this morning is, what does the church think about all this? What does it do about this? What is the role of the faith community in being pastoral shepherds in the midst of this very unwieldy block? 
and specifically, what should we be doing about it here at Wesley Seminary? So, a little bit about public theology, since I am now apparently a distinguished professor <laughs> thereof. <laughs> First, what is public theology? Um, e. Harold Breitenberg describes it as, quote, an informed, descriptive, and normative public discourse about public issues, institutions, and interactions addressed to the church or other religious bodies as well as the larger public or publics. That's the classic academic definition. I'm not sure I really have any idea what that means. <laughs> but one of our nation's founders, Benjamin Franklin, spoke often of what he called public religion. Rousseau used the term civil religion. What we know is that deep in the heart of what we think of ourselves as Americans, we respect freedom of religion because we came here to get away from those who would impose dogma and state religion uh, and tell us what we th should or should not believe. So that's our kind of national legacy, a nation of believers for the most part who confess an enormous devotion to God and worship. Did you know, by the way, that almost three quarters of America profess a belief in God and as many as two-thirds say that they regularly attend worship. Now tell that to every pastor who struggles to find <laughs> membership and attendance. I think regular attendance might equate with going on uh, thank you, thank you. I think um, <clears throat> regular attendance probably equates with being there on Easter and Christmas Eve and that the encounters with the divine may more often be on the golf course but, uh, <laughs> or watching me progress. <clears throat> but we are a fiercely independent nation and we dislike it when people tell us what to believe. And we especially dislike it when either government or the church tells us what we have to believe. Now compared to other Western democracies, we are still a very religious country. Uh, we respect the multi-faith aspect of our nation, the growing diversity that we have. Uh, it's not right to say that we are necessarily only a Christian nation because we are absorbing uh, people of other faiths, but our founders, if you think of it, people like Jefferson and Madison, they were people of strong faith, and in cases like Jefferson, he did kind of selectively choose what he believed. Remember, he cut out of his Bible the things that he thought were not believable and gives <coughs> meaning to the term holy Bible. Uh, but most of our founders were educated in places like Harvard and Yale and Princeton and the College of William and Mary, were, and the curriculum they had would be very approximate to some of what we have as a curriculum here at Wesley Seminary. They were being trained in places in which faith was part of the way in which they grew intellectually into the life that they would have as leaders of our nation. So for them, the concept of separation of church and state was never that religion would be separate from the idea of America. They meant only that the worship of the divine was open to men, and yes, they were mostly talking about men, men who would not have their state religion imposed on them. They would be free to worship with their families as they saw fit. Now, a more useful definition of what we talk about as public theology, more modern, comes from scholars like Martin Marty, who says this in his kind of classic book on this called The Public Church. When the public church reflexively examines and critiques existing social practices and cultural understandings in the light of its deepest religious insights into justice and the good society, it does public theology. So we have kind of a dual kingdom approach to politics and religion, one suggested all the way back through Martin Luther, Aquinas, and Augustine. We owe allegiance to the city of man governed hopefully by magistrates of goodwill and concern for the common good, but our primary loyalty is to the Lord of all, the King who redeemed <coughs> us with the body and the blood of the Savior who will usher us into the city of God. Now that's a very Christian perspective, but it's one that holds true for most Americans, even if they don't say it necessarily exactly that way. We are, as I said, a Christian nation. 
However, in the way in which we respect individual freedom and respect for religious liberty, we accommodate those of other faiths and those who have no faith. That's an especially important and poignant observation as we note that a growing percentage of Americans profess no allegiance to any organized religion. If you're familiar with the Pew Research Center, they've once again reminded us just recently that a hefty percentage of Americans are nuns, not N-U-N-S, but none as in none of the above when it comes to affiliating with established religion. They seek spirituality away from the organized church, and that's especially true and growing in its number among those who are the youngest, uh, under age 25. <clears throat> so we have a dilemma. A nation that's profoundly unhappy with its institutions of self-government and democracy, a nation turning away at the same time from the church, which has always been at its best a bedrock of social cohesion and common purpose. There are those who see the church as sort of a static place of orthodoxy and dogma, reluctant to adjust to new demands of modernity. And even worse, there are those who see the church as hypocritical, not living out a profession that care most about those who are lost, disenfranchised, impoverished, homeless, and alone. And yes, there are those who are simply self-absorbed, <coughs> interested only in their own wealth and advancement, and they have no time for a communion that wants to advance a common good. So where is the church? What do we do amidst this dysfunction in our public institutions and the decline in our authority to speak truth to the powers which influence <coughs> our lives and our society. And that's where I would say we have been too often missing in action. In our history, the church has spoken clearly, but not always on the right side of whatever the historical outcome has been. We drew many in during our early periods through the Great Awakenings. We informed the inspired hands of those founders who drafted our basic documents of liberty and independence and constitutional authority. We erred when we gave theological comfort to the proponents of slavery and then segregation. So we recovered, and we helped give life to a movement for civil rights. We added our voice to the prophecy of Martin Luther King, Jr. We tried to get it right on prohibition, and we were wrong when we figured out that there were other, when we didn't figure out that there were other ways to combat addictions, which sapped some of our soulful strength. And we have joined with those who are concerned about the condition of God's creation, our planet. And we've worked to preserve its integrity, and now work to ensure its survival. Our National Council of Churches, if you remember, was one of the original founders of what we still call Earth Day. We are now in the midst of another debate about sexuality and how we define marriage and equality in the midst of rapidly changing public opinion. The church won't be universal on that question, but I have no doubt in time that we will use our influence to bring people together, in our case, bring them to the love that God offers us through the example of Jesus Christ. And here is where I think politics and religion do part ways. Politics is the art of the possible, where the self-interests of the community are compromised so that the majority prevails even as the minority receives due respect and consideration. Politics, like economics, is based on the efficient maximization of self-interest. But self-interest must be for some common good if we are to survive as a community. My friend and colleague on the Commission on Presidential Debates that I co-chair, former Senator um, Jack Danforth of Missouri, a, a good self-avowed practicing Episcopalian Republican. Uh, he wrote a book recently uh, called The Relevance of Religion, How Faithful People Can Change Politics. And he writes in that book this, Religion is the counterweight to self-interest. It sets love of God and love of neighbor against love of self. And for Christians, it does so in the starkest and most absolute of terms. There's nothing half-hearted about it. The standard by which Christians measure 
Our love for each other is Christ's love for us to the point of his unimaginably awful death on the cross. Senator Danforth goes on to suggest that our willingness to serve more than self-interest is the gift that religion can give to politics. The example of Christ on the cross may be an unfair example, and he admits that. He invokes Reinhold Niebuhr and saying that loving your neighbor or your political opponent in the way Jesus loved us does not require the ultimate sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. You don't have to die for your opponent. But rather, there is an impossible possibility, an impossible possibility, that maybe we can use Christ's sacrifice on the cross as a measure of what it means to truly love your neighbor, and for that purpose, your political opponent, as yourself. So I, for me, that suggests what might be a golden rule in politics. Thou shalt treat your political opponent in the way you yourself would want to be treated. Now, think about that for a moment. Think of the vocabulary you hear in our politics and whether any politician adheres to the starting point, do unto others. Okay, quick story. In 1979, I was a young press secretary to Senator P. Williams from New Jersey, and we were guiding a controversial piece of legislation on labor law reform through the Senate. We, we were facing a very determined Republican filibuster was led by Warren Hatch from Utah, who is still in the Senate now. And in the midst of that fight, I drafted a press release which would have quoted my boss, Senator Williams, to the effect that I remember this phrase so precisely. Any senator who suggests this bill leads to mandatory unionization is stretching truth to the breaking point. I heard that again, stretching truth to the breaking point. Well, I gave the draft of this press release to my boss, uh, the chief of staff, a wonderful guy named Walt Ram Ramsey. And he looked at me and he signaled to me to go out into the hallway with him at the Russell Senate office building. And he said, be glad that that press release never went out. Because if it had gone out, I would have had to fire you. Because you were more or less saying in that press release that Warren Hatch was a liar. And we don't talk that way here in the United States Senate. Now, think about that <laughs> stretching truth to the breaking point. That is probably about as milk-toast a phrase <laughs> as you can imagine in the current vocabulary of our politics. But I wonder, where are the adults now who take young hotshot press secretaries out to wash their mouths out with soap? Where are the people who actually bring civility into the equation and adhere to some standards of decency when it comes to the way in which we conduct our politics. We live in a culture where <coughs> deviancy has been dumbed down, as one of my other former bosses, Daniel Pat Moynihan, once put it. Behavior that would have been objectionable is now not only tolerated, it's sometimes even encouraged. <coughs> the sharpest soundbite, the angriest comeback, the most clever and snarky quote is now rewarded with affirmation on cable television shows, on internet websites, on those places that thrive with bombast and contrast rather than communion. Mark Leibovich uh, from the New York Times wrote an essay in the New York Times Sunday Magazine yesterday about the culture of truthers, those who use contorted facts, opinion disguised as research, uh, and the ongoing battle between fact and opinion, and he wrote uh, this. The internet is a super collider of alternative interpretations, if not realities, and the people who embrace them. People then marginalize those views by calling perpetrators truthers. Things can get very pitched in short order. Every topic, Benghazi, drugs in California, life on Mars, becomes a potential battlefield between information and misinformation, truth and truthers. Senator Moynihan used to say that we are all entitled to our own opinions, but not to our own facts. 
And yet, that is what our political discourse now makes available. We can live in our own self-defined world, where whether it's Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, the New York Times, a host of conservative websites, or we can live with NPR, the New York Times, Network News, what many call the liberal media, and we all will have consumed many of the same facts, but we will still be inhabiting a parallel universe. It seems to me that this is the place where religion makes its gift to politics. We gather together each week. We sit together in pews that are not marked conservative or liberal or Democrat or Republican. We're there to cherish each other being together in one body. And yes, maybe our churches are not as diverse as they should be, maybe they're not reflecting every point of view, but there are different points of view in our churches, and among the, they are among the last places left where someone can encounter a person with a different political perspective. The basis of conversation does not begin with confrontation, but with beliefs shared in common. Can't we leverage some of that common love in order to do something for the common good? We lament that members of Congress do not live together, have dinner parties together, have kids who play on the same soccer teams, who barely know each other. But isn't that what the church could offer? Can't we draw on those who disagree and bring them into fellowship so that maybe they could discover along with us something that represents what we would think of as the common good? Can't the church sponsor and foster discussions which break down some of this polarization and division which characterize our current national discourse. What would it take for pastors in local congregations to truly be repairers of the breach so that they can help na congregations navigate controversial issues and discover some common ground? This is huge, as Donald Trump would say. <laughs> Churches in which pastors engage discuss controversial contemporary issues rather than running the opposite direction. Clergy who can lift up prophetic, uh, a prophetic voice and bind people together. Congregations that might be uncomfortable or disagree but come together to understand. Churches where anyone who feels that their political viewpoint is not agreed with but nonetheless still respected and heard. So the very point of this talk Churches where the current dysfunction of the city of Washington is being repaired, can it be repaired by people who are citizens of the city of God? That seems to me a very worthy purpose for a seminary like Wesley that takes seriously its location here in Washington, D.C. That's why we have established here what we now call the Center for Public Theology to address much of what I've talked about this morning. Last semester I taught a course uh, called public theology for local congregations. And we got great reviews on the evaluation form, Dean Martin, so you know. Um, but many of the students said, look, we need to be trained, actually trained, in how to engage our congregations in more useful and loving dialogue about some of these hard issues that we face. It's not that easy. And no, it isn't. We are one in the body but we are not always of one mind when it comes to politics, campaigns, controversial issues, the issues that divide us and polarize us. So it will take some discernment to develop the correct pedagogy. It will take uh, ways in which we can instill new patterns of behavior and help our students understand what they can do to encourage new behavior. And frankly, it's not going to be right for them to impose political views of a certain partisan nature on their congregations. We, we don't want preachers calling for the election of certain candidates or necessarily even sometimes taking certain partisan political views. Among other things, that happens to be against the law. But I hope that it's why those of you who are here who support Wesley <coughs> Seminary at least leave with some confidence that we are going to try to get it right when it comes to what we are doing to advance a better public discourse. We will help train and teach a generation of church leaders who I hope will be fearless when it comes to confronting controversy. We will help them overcome rejection, disagreement, 
the grumbling that has been with the people of God all the way back to Jeremiah. And we will help them promote something that is a common good, common for all of our communities, and a common good for the benefit of our nation. That, to me, is truly a worthy purpose for a seminary like Wesley. Thank you very much. I have suggested much, and I hope provoked many, and I would love to have some questions you can ask me about. You can even ask me about Hillary or Monica or any of the other women in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a growing contingent of pastors across the country who are specifically challenging the nonpartisan aspect of preaching and are openly going to, in this coming election, um, support specific candidates from the pulpit in defiance of the law that you just mentioned. And what I'm told is that the administration is putting that on very low back burner, not to not to not to challenge this for the IRS not to challenge this because of political backlash. Um, all right, here is a dark secret from the world of politics that I inhabited for nearly thirty five years. Political operatives and campaign people see the church in raw political terms. For conservatives on the right, particularly those who were trying to advance more strident positions when it came to abortion and right to life, the Catholic Church and the leaflets on the cars outside the parish after Mass were important ways of mobilizing political constituencies. For those of us on the Democratic side, going to church on Sunday largely meant going to African American churches where there was some expectation that pastors from the pulpit would motivate congregations to turn out and vote for the Democrats that we support. It was subliminal and not overt and moving in the direction that you just asked about a more overt appeal to political affiliation is the exact opposite of what I'm trying to describe as a way in which religion gives the politics a discussion that more is about a common good. Because once you take a specific position, you ignore the prospect that people who disagree with you can come together and have some reconciling conversation. So that to me would be very, very troubling. I've heard, I, I think I know exactly what your question is about. Because there are people who say it is time for the church to take a more strident political point of view. That's not what I'm arguing here. I'm arguing that we've got to think of different ways in which to inform that conversation and not be shy about it. Because the, the opposite of the problem is that too often pastors don't want to antagonize one half of their congregation, and they ignore these subjects. And we can't have that either. So we've got to find some place in which that common ground gets established. Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly where this would go, but the Pope, if you'd like to talk about the Pope in this context. Pope um, Francis, when he was here, called specifically upon those people who were in that Congress that he addressed to understand what their responsibilities were exactly around what I'm suggesting here, to call people to greater awareness from a position of faith and use that position of faith to address the things that are required for the common good. And he, he was careful in avoiding, he didn't depart from the orthodoxy of the Catholic Church, and he was very careful about that. <coughs> But his tone and his substance and his example by being there reflects kind of what I'm talking about here. That it was really a, a person of strong faith, obviously a leader of significance, 
speaking to people about how they could address from their position of moral values and faith the issues that are so substantively important. A willingness to work with people, atheists, others who have common ground with justice. Uh, right, right. It was a, an appeal for the Catholic moral tradition of economic justice and social justice framed in a way in which nobody could ignore the responsibilities they had as elected <coughs> leaders. I mean, that was the significance of it. And, and, and you know, we should credit the former Speaker of the House, John Boehner, who insisted on having him come there. You know, were, there were times in our history where the idea that the Pope would stand up and address the elected Congress of the United States of America would have been an abomination mm -hmm. in the eyes So that is... But not that, not that long ago. So that, that is something to celebrate. Yeah. So in full disclosure, I'm married, as some know, to a Republican member of Congress, and he's been in for about 30 years. And I went to Wesley and got my MDiv here uh, five years ago. And uh, two, two things. One, uh, I, it's always difficult to hear people um, talk about the institution <coughs> that we so love, and I know you so love as well. And I go around uh, telling people uh, in this atmosphere that we find ourselves in that, you know, teachers used to say, oh, I'm just a teacher. But until they started saying, I'm a teacher, and I'm proud of it. Um, and so part of my um, reaction to your great talk this morning is that um, there are wonderful people in Washington, and there are great uh, defenders of, of our public service. And Fred, I think, is one of them, but I think there are many. I think there are many lobbyists who actually are there for the right reasons, defending certain <coughs> ideas and wanting to be in dialogue. There are people who I think serve the government um, in a time where it's very difficult to be a public servant because everywhere you go, people think you are the dregs of the dregs. So I'm here to bring you promise and hope that there are good people there serving the country. And I know you're saying that. I'm going to ask you a take my opportunity to ask you a leading question. But let me just finish what I was going to say. So I am the director of adult education at a large Presbyterian church in Alexandria, and we have just held a series on mental health. And we have people in our congregation who are Democrats and Republicans who are very diverse, military, and it was one of the most uh, popular series we've held, and I planned it. It's been a year in planning, and we brought uh, Dr. Tom Inzel in from the National Institute of Mental Health and he gave us a survey, an overview on a Sunday night and then we had a series of classes the next three Sundays. It's very popular and I am now doing a series on immigration which is you know, a very daring thing to do in a congregation like ours and we're bringing in a, a panel of people over a series of Sundays that bring in all different points of view about immigration both from the legal from the judicial and from on the ground serving those with whom are, are uh, both legal and illegal uh, immigrants. And I would encourage uh, the people who are giving the, to Wesley, you know, my education here really was an amazing education. And I thought I would be in one place and it turns out I'm in another. And it is this merging of faith and politics that you're talking you, about. You are the very model of what I was trying to describe. And I, I probably neglected to say as much as you're changing young seminarians to go into the church, many of them, like you, like me, are going to be taking those roles in some lay capacity. They're not necessarily going to be clergy. And I think that is a very, very critical thing that we recognize here because we know we are training a generation of leaders for the church mm -hmm. that are not necessarily headed for ordination. But here's my chance to turn the question back on you. It is often said that some of the dysfunction that exists within our Congress now is because people are not developing the kinds of personal relationships that they had when they actually came and lived here. In fact, mm -hmm. some of you saw Dana Milbank in the Washington Post yesterday said, what we ought to do is go back to the days in which members of Congress moved to Washington with their families and stayed here and lived here so that they could work with each other and get to know each other. So I guess my question is, did you and Fred get opportunities to socialize with folks on the other side of the aisle and get any time together where you build relationships and get to know each other because it's so much harder to demonize someone if you've gone out to dinner with them or if your kids are playing on the same soccer team or if you live we in the same We hear that neighborhood. a lot too and, and I think the most difficult decision 
we always made a decision based on our own family needs. It tended to be the opposite of what the public was doing so that when my kids were really, really little and it was everybody was living in D.C., I lived in Michigan. And then vice versa, I've been living in D.C. the last 15, 20 years. And everybody's been living in their district. But there are lots of friendships that are merged in a different way. Yes, we do have friends on both sides of the aisle and we make a point. Yeah. But it's not to the degree that it once was where people were here, you know, on a regular basis. You know, our, our new Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, who, who properly says I really am I'm going to take this job on my terms, and it's going to have to include the time that I'm going to spend with my family. But as a point of pride, he says, I've got a cot in my office, and I come and I sleep in my office, and presumably get out of the house gym and shower in the morning and get ready for a new day of work. And that, you know, the more I thought about that, I said, I would so much rather have you connecting in ways with people on the other side of the aisle where you would actually get to know them better and develop more personal relationships rather than work until 10 o'clock at night and sleeping in your office on a cot. Because that, that social element is, I think, a root cause of some of what's wrong with our system now. And it's exactly what, where the church could foster relationships. We should open ways in which we could actually bring people together for that kind of fellowship. I think that's a role we could play. Yeah. One of the beauties for me as, as a Wesley graduate was, for one thing, Amy and I were classmates, and so I frequently, as a liberal Democrat, asked how my favorite Republican was. So this campus, when I was here, was so diverse that I was interacting and encountering a fabric of folks <coughs> and then taking that out into the community. And hallelujah for that, and I hope it continues. Well, the diversity is <coughs> still here. It's global in its dimension now because we encounter so many students who are from many, many other places, yeah, particularly Korea and Asia, and that's a growing part of what we are doing with our student body. Um, and it is true that we do have political diversity in our ranks, but I would have to confess that this is a, you know, we are a liberal Protestant institution. And so it is not easy. I, I hear from the more conservative of our students sometimes that it is difficult for them to feel like they are being embraced. So all of what I've talked about, about preaching to the common good and bringing people together, we have to reflect in what we are doing here in our teaching and in our classrooms and being respectful and mindful of the fact that there is not one orthodoxy. And that was a growing edge. Yes. Yeah. So Rather than cots and offices, maybe there needs to be um, congressional dorms. Many Americans would say that would be better called a prison. <laughs> but that's that, that's not a bad idea. I mean, there there, there was a, I can't remember the movie or the show, but about the house in which many members of Congress have been Chuck Schumer was one. They all lived together, and. Uh, and that does, you know, that does make a difference. Mm -hmm. That they, in my memory is that those were not people who were congregating with folks of different perspectives always. They were you know, more of like money. Again, like you said, you, a lot of people you're trying to hear uh, do not see coordination. Uh, but the earlier picture you painted of the possibility that churches have, uh, we have dialogue typically taking place inside of a building that's a church. Uh, so would you speak to the issue of denominationalism uh, as it applies to this uh, kind of uh, You mean denominationalism in the sense that... Mm. Well, I mean, you take it in the Methodist Church, we have we have rules we pay no attention, some of us pay no attention to. <laughs> no one is going to tell, you know, and things like that. And I'm the Episcopal Church, which has divided itself over issues. Yeah. These are the forum forums that... Uh, well, I, I think we have healthy dialogue here around the polity of the church, you can well imagine that, for example, on the question of sexuality, the current discipline of the United Methodist Church is not warmly embraced by many of the students here who call themselves Methodists. But that is what a place of theological education ought to be. It ought to be a place where we examine and think and 
and discuss and talk about where we're headed. We have to then, and, and those who seek ordination, submit to a vow of obedience to their denominational polity, whatever it is. And I, I think our students respect that, but they want to be part of a healthy dialogue if they feel like things need to be challenged. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to my own experience when I got my own degree here. I took the course in United Methodist Polity, and, and it was, you know, a very clear and sober look at the requirements of our faith tradition. Um, with the idea not that we were going to figure out how to be subversive, but about how we could actually understand and challenge and see where there would be places of uh, disagreement and contention, and then how would we deal with that? And that was kind of what the course that Luke, Professor Lou Parks taught. That was the direction he took us. How do you deal with those who might disagree? Because I, I think as every Methodist here knows on the question of homosexuality, we are split right down the middle. You know, we, could, we could, in fact, probably see our de denomination itself split on this issue if we're not careful. So these are things, you know, the kind of things that we ought to be wrestling with at a place like Wesley Seminary, and I think we do. Yeah. <coughs> Speaking as a student who is here and, and does wrestle with those things, that's the conversations that we have on a daily basis. Whether you're a student pastor, whether you're someone who hasn't even begun ministry yet, these are the questions that we're wrestling with on a daily basis. How far do we let our personal convictions or our personal religious... How do we let the things that we feel are so important to us about Jesus and his ministry and how we feel that we should be living out our call and ministry, how do we let that influence what some may see as a political realm? Um, a lot of us don't see a clear definition in a line anymore. There isn't the religious and then the political. It's all one thing. And so how does one stay true to your supposed nonprofit status and not speak at the pulpit when everything that is regarded as political anymore has to do with our religion and has to do with how we feel the call of Jesus in our lives. The most encouraging thing that you said is that this is something that you talk about 